Well, good morning. Good morning. What a beautiful day. What a great day to be in the Lord's house, to worship together, to grow together as we study God's Word and as we reorder our lives around who God is and His plan and His purpose for us. We come to the conclusion of a really great series. We've been in this three-week series talking about what is a disciple and what is the DNA of a disciple, of somebody who's committed to follow Jesus. What is the DNA of God's church? And we've, we've really boiled it down to this, that a disciple is somebody who reaches out, who grows up, who gives all for the glory of God. Somebody who is fully in tune and fully engaged for the glory of God's name. Now, we said the first week when reaches out, and what does that mean? And we looked at Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18 through 20, where Jesus gave us what's called the Great Commission. And right before he ascends into heaven, he pulls his disciples together. And, and don't you think some of Jesus' last words are going to be pretty important? I mean, you know, it's like, okay, guys, I want you to get this. If you missed anything else, I want you to get this. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And listen, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And Jesus pouring into his disciples and saying, guys, I want you to go be the hands and feet of Christ. I want you to go share love. I want you to go share the same grace that you have been given and the same love that has been poured out on you. I want you to reach out to others. And we've said this isn't a country club. This isn't simply a holy huddle. This is a group of believers who are called by God to reach out. Last week, we talked about growing up. And we said Romans 8, 29 in the Bible says, you know, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. That God's goal for you, that God's plan for you is that your life would look more and more like Jesus. And we do that as we simply make ourselves available to God, as God draws us to himself and we step over that line and say yes. And when this begins a lifelong journey of following Jesus, we said that comes as he works on our attitude, he works on our character, right? We have that old carnal man, that selfish nature within us, and we get angry and greedy and envious and all these things that God goes to work on our character. And we said it comes as we study the Word of God, as we grow deeper in our relationship with Him. It, it comes as we give back and invest. It comes as, as we begin to be people of prayer, and listening to God, and God telling us, and developing that intimate walk with Him. But over time, we grow, we mature. And maybe, you know, if you've been a believer for a few years, or five years, or 20 years, or 30 years, you can look back over your life and say, I'm maturing. Now, I'm not there yet, right? I mean, we can all say that, right? I'm not there yet. I have a long way to go, but I am growing in my faith. And things that are alive, they grow. And you and I, when we're alive in Christ, we grow, we mature, we become who God wants us to be. It doesn't happen overnight. It is a journey. It's a process. And today, we look at the third component, giving all, giving all. And what we see here is that when Jesus calls us, he doesn't call us to a partial commitment, right? He doesn't say, hey, if you don't have anything else to do, or maybe in your spare time, come follow me. You know, Jesus is calling us to a full-on give-all commitment. It's not like when you go to a restaurant, you order a steak, and then they say, here's all the add-ons, you know, and a lot of people are like, oh yeah, I want to do this with my life, and then I'll add on little Jesus over here, you know, and he's going, no, 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 no. I want to be all in. I, I want to be the Lord of your life. You know, there's not a part-time army ranger, right? There's not a part-time Navy SEAL. I mean, you're either all in or you're out. I mean, you, you know, it's this call that every part of my life for the glory of God, every aspect of me. And a lot of times what happens is we try to compartmentalize our life, right? I've got my work over here. I've got my family over here. You know, I've got my dreams and goals over here. And then I want a little bit of Jesus. And, and I'm going to have a little bit of Jesus over here. But Jesus, I'll get to you on Sunday because I've got the rest of the week to kind of handle, you know, career and family and goals. And, and Jesus is going, woo uh, uh. I want to be at the center of your heart. I want you to be a godly husband, and father, or wife and mother, I want you to be a godly grandparent. I want you to be a godly roommate. I want to be the first thought. I want you to be godly in your work. I want you to be a person of integrity and character that it flows out of me. I want to be Lord even over your dreams and your desires. I want to be at the center of your heartbeat, of your life. I want you to give all and to follow me. I'm not looking for part-time. I'm not looking for add-on. 
I'm not looking for, you know, hey, if you don't have anything else to do, then maybe throw Jesus in there. I want to be the center of your heart. And so we're talking about that as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus. Is he the Lord of my life? Now, when you look at give all, there's some different components, right? I mean, we can talk about time. We could talk about talent. We could talk about resources. And, and all those are important. When we look at time, we say that really is a part of growing up because I need to spend time reading the Word of God. I mean, this is how I'm going to grow. When I dive deeper into God's Word, I need to spend time being in a small group where I'm being discipled or being here on Sunday mornings where we're studying the Word together and growing together. Also, my talents. I mean, praise God, that's a way that we can give back. That's why we talk about worship one hour, serve one hour, you know. Our worship team's amazing. We don't pay anybody up here. They're volunteers. A lot of them, they go out on the road and they're traveling during the week. And then they're back here on Sundays using their gifts for the glory of God. I mean, in children's ministry or student ministry or greeters or ushers. But a way to use our talents and say, I don't just use my talent to make money. I use my talent for the glory of God too. I can use those as gifts. But also, as we look at give all, there's a different component as well, and it's the resources. It's the things that God has entrusted to me. And as you look at your life, as I look at my life, you know what? We brought nothing into this world, and we're going to take nothing out of this world. And so really, we are simply stewards of everything that God has given to us. And we get it for like, you know, 70, 80, 90 years, and then it's all gone. And so God says, what do you do with what you've been given? Do you just take it to build your own kingdom? Or are you using everything I've entrusted to you for my name and for my glory? And here's the heartbeat of it. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, he said, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other. He'll be devoted to one. He'll despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. He said, you can't do it. Do you know that in Scripture, Jesus talked more about money and resources than any other topic? Why? Because he knew it was the chief competitor for our hearts. He knows us. He knows the way we're created. And it's, it's true for all of us, isn't it? I mean, how many times have we thought, you know what, if I could just win the lottery, woo, I would have it made, you know? I mean, if I won that Powerball, woo, all my problems would be solved. I would have it made. You know, we fall into that trap, don't we? Until we read about lottery winners, and then we go, wait a minute, more money, more problems. It doesn't work that way. But a lot of times, that's our mindset. If I get this raise, if I get this promotion, if I could pay off this car, if I could get their house, wow, they've got a huge house. If I could get their car, if I had their kind of stuff, I wouldn't have any issues. And he's going, no, 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 no. What can happen in your life is we can focus so much on what we don't have that we miss out on what we do have. That we have a God of the universe who loves us. And the God of the universe who has entrusted everything that we have to us. And God who says, I want to be on the throne of your heart. I want you to be all in. And I want you to be willing to give all. So let's look at that today. If you have a Bible with you this morning, I invite you up with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, New Testament, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, Romans, then 1 and 2 Corinthians. So New Testament, and we're going to be diving into this, this great letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. Now, if you don't have a Bible, maybe you have a mobile device, you can access the Scriptures online and, and go to Version. Uh, you can even take notes there as well, or maybe you have a worship guide, you can take notes in there. Or we're going to put Scripture on the screen. So we always come back to what does the Word of God say? What, what is God communicating to us, and what do we want to him to tell us today so that we can reorder our lives around what he wants us to do and who he wants us to be. So 2 Corinthians, when you get to chapter 8, we're just going to be in verses 1 through 12. But when you get there, I want to set the stage a little bit, okay? So remember Jesus, he, he gives this great commission to his disciples. And then at the beginning of Acts, he ascends into heaven. And, and now he says to his disciples, right? He's, he's told them, you know, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And so these disciples are huddled together and they're going... Jesus is ascended into heaven. What are we going to do? And sure enough, the Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit descends upon the disciples. And, and, and man, 
things start happening. They stand up at Pentecost. Peter preaches. 3,000 people accept Christ. And the early church takes off. You talk about church growth. I mean, it's incredible. 3,000 people are added to the church overnight. And then the church, as you read through the book of Acts, starts to grow. I mean, these people love each other. These people are serving one another. And everybody wants to be a part of it because Jesus is in their midst. And it grows to 5,000, grows to 20,000. Then you get to Acts chapter 8 and persecution comes. Persecution comes from the Romans, from the Jews. There's this persecution on the early church. Well, what happens then is people scatter, right? They go and they, they start to live with their extended family or friends. They, they leave from Jerusalem and go out all over the Roman Empire. And what I love about this is even in the midst of the hard times under persecution, God had a plan and God had a purpose. And it was to spread his word. And maybe you're here today and you're going through a hard time, you're going through a real difficult time in your life. Listen, God can redeem that. And God can do something in your life that you can't even imagine. And we get focused on, oh, the the hardships right now and God's going, hold on, I'm with you. I haven't given up on you. I haven't left you. I am with you right now. But I'm also accomplishing something greater in your life, something you can't even imagine. I'm doing something amazing. And it's so true in our lives when we look back, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty, and some of the roughest times of our life is where God did his best work, right? Some of the hardest times of our lives, we look back and we go, that's when I felt the presence of God. That's when I knew God in a more intimate way than ever before. And you can imagine the persecution that was coming for those people. Then they take off and they go to their family, their friends, their extended family in the Roman Empire. And back then, the Romans had conquered everything. And so you didn't have a visa to travel to different countries. I mean, you know, you had a common language. And so they go and what do they do? They tell people about Jesus. And churches spring up all over the place, all over the Roman Empire. And so the Apostle Paul, when he's doing his missionary journeys, he's going to these churches that are springing up everywhere. And Paul, when you get to 2 Corinthians, he's writing this letter to the church in Corinth because he says, hey guys, we need to take an offering. We need to give. We need to help because our brothers and sisters in Christ back in Jerusalem are going through a really hard time. The the people who live there, they're they're in a difficult place. And so we want to give all to help them, to help make an impact. And so in these first 12 verses, he gives us really five essentials for giving all in our lives in the matter of resources and what that means. And the first is this, and you see it in verse one. He says, and now brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Giving all, giving all is an expression of the grace of God. It's the grace of God. Notice he doesn't say, hey, when I went to these churches and I said, hey guys, jump in and be involved and and let's help out people. Let's give to people, you know, out of the bounty that God's given us. He says, it wasn't, this is how much they gave. It was, they gave because of the grace of God in their life. They gave because they, they realized what God had done for them. Do you realize that everything we have comes from God? I mean, think about it. Everything I have, the breath of my lungs comes from God, right? That I was even born here in the United States, that I was born to have the opportunities I have, that I was born into a family that I was born into. You realize half of the world lives on less than $2 a day? Why do I have the privilege of going to the universities I have, the to be able to study. How did I get the opportunities to have the jobs I have? Now, a lot of times we go, well, I worked really hard for this. I earned this. I earned this house. I earned this car. I earned this. There is a part that you and I, we work hard and that's important and we give our best. But we always have to realize at any moment, this could be gone. And really, did I create the opportunities in the first place? And when we forget about God and God's work in our life, it becomes all about me. But we have to remember, it's by God's grace that I'm even breathing today. Why did I not have a heart attack this morning? You know, why am I even here? Why is there breath in my lungs? Because God has a plan and God has a purpose for me. In the churches in Macedonia, as Apostle Paul went around and said, hey guys, we need to give back. We need to help out. They were like, yes, we want to be involved because of what God has done from us. And in our lives, we can never forget about the grace of God. 
Paul talks about in these next couple of verses three things that really inspired them and motivated them. Verse two, he says, out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. He, he said, you know what? These guys weren't wealthy. These guys weren't exorbitantly rich, you know? I mean, think about it. A lot of them had left their stuff and their things in Jerusalem and they fled to be with extended family or to stay with people. But, but he, what did he say? Number one, he said, out of their overflowing joy. Out of their overflowing joy. See, joy and generosity go together, don't they? Joy and generosity go together. You know, you go to somebody's baby shower, you're excited for them, so you want to take a present. You go to somebody's birthday party, you, you love them, you care about them, you want to take a present. You're excited for what's happening. Grace and generosity are synonyms. He said, hey, these churches, out of their overflowing joy, they wanted to give back. They wanted to be involved in what God was doing. He said in verse 3, right, he says, for I testified that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. He says, you wouldn't believe their generosity. You wouldn't believe how they wanted to give back, even beyond their ability. Now, I love that because here's the thing about giving all to Christ. Whenever you put a little in the hands of the master, he multiplies it, right? I mean, he just does things. And one day Jesus was teaching and there was this huge crowd that was there. The Bible says 5,000 men. So you can add on women and children that were there. 5,000 men. And Jesus was on a roll. I mean, he was teaching and people were listening and there were, you know, just life was being transformed right there. And his disciples go, hey, Jesus, you're getting a little long. These people are hungry. They're tired. You know, send them away and let them get something to eat. And Jesus looked at him and said, you feed them. <laughs> there's 5,000 men. I mean, there's probably 15,000 people here. I, it would take a year's wages to feed these people one meal. And Jesus said, so what do you have? Oh, there's a little kid over here. He's got five loaves and two fish. Bring it to me. This little kid, man, he just gave everything, right? Here you go. He put it in the hands of Jesus. And you know the story. Jesus prays. He blesses it. They start to pass it out. And they pass it out to every person that's there. And there's 12 basketfuls left over. <laughs> that's even beyond their ability. I mean, there's no way that stuff happens. Yeah, but it does when you're with Jesus. He said, these churches, they just said, hey, we trust. It may not be a whole lot, but we're going to put it in the hands of Jesus and watch what he does. He says, entirely, entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. <laughs> he said, here's the third one, right? They gave themselves first to the Lord. They prayed. They said, God, what do you want us to do? God, you've entrusted to me resources. And whether it's a, it's a big house or whether it's a car or whether it's things or stuff, but you've entrusted that to me. So God, what do you want me to do with the things that you've given me? How do you want me to use what you've given me for your name and for your glory? You know, we can't do everything, right? I mean, there's always things that we want to do, but we can't do it all. But when the Holy Spirit prompts our hearts, that's when we step out. When the Holy Spirit stirs us and we see a need and we say, okay, maybe somebody needs to stay in my house. Maybe somebody needs a place to live. Maybe somebody, I can help drive them someplace or help meet a need. Maybe I've been blessed in this way and I can give to them when the Holy Spirit prompts us, we do it. Why? Because of the grace of God. Giving all is an expression of the grace of God in our lives. Giving all, number two, is this. It's, it's the DNA of a Christ follower. It's the DNA of a Christ follower. Verse six, he talks about Titus bringing this letter to the church in Corinth. But look at verse seven. He says, but, that, but, but just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, in your love for us, See that you also excel in this grace of giving. He said, hey, you're growing in your love. You're loving people. You're excelling there. Good job. You're excelling in your faith. But also excel in this grace of giving. Also excel in being generous, in being gracious. Have a culture of generosity within you because that's your DNA. Martin Luther said, when a conversion happens, there's really three conversions that take place. When somebody follows Jesus and gives their life to Christ, there's really three conversions. It's the conversion of the heart, the heart, the conversion of the mind, 
As T.W. Hunt says, developing the mind of Christ. And then he says the conversion of the purse. <laughs> it's putting it into action. It's saying, hey, I'm going to follow. I'm going to trust. I'm going to be generous. I'm going to help out. I'm going to give. And I want to give back. You know, DNA is at the heart of us as a church at Rolling Hills. I mean, whenever we give on Sunday mornings, and, and whether it's a tithe here or tithe online or whatever we do, we give. You know, as a church, we tithe on the tithe. You know, we, we take 10% of what's given and we, we use it to help support orphans in Moldova. Or the poorest of the poor in the Amazon. We, we use it around the world. We use it right here in our own community to meet needs. We had a Saturday serve yesterday and going out and spreading the love of Christ and, and, and feeding the homeless. That's important. It's not just, hey, let's take all the resources for us. It's like, how can we give back? How can we serve? By God's grace, when we moved into this building four years ago, it was 143,000 square feet. We're like, we don't need all that kind of space. And so God blessed, right? The state of Tennessee leases 10,000 square feet from us. All of foster care for Williamson County comes through our building. Uh, they do. Uh, you notice Comcast leases 10,000 square feet. You've seen the trucks. I don't know if you've seen those, but they're there, you know, right up front. I mean, do you know Naxus? There's a, uh, Naxus is the largest distributor of classical music in North America. And it all comes out of our building right back here, 30,000 square feet. Uh, classical music going all over Canada, North America, over, over here. I mean, it's amazing. But you know what that does? Is by God's grace, these different companies pay rent to the church and so that we can use when we give money that we give, we goes to missions and ministry and not just for bricks and mortar. It's just in the DNA of the church. And then the leadership says, this is what we want to do to maximize the financial stewardship of us as the body of Christ because everything we have is God's. And so as we plant a new campus in South Nashville, we're looking for a warehouse that we can replicate the model so that we can be good stewards of what God's been given to us. The same as a church is the same for individuals. That God has blessed us, but we look at that and say, God, how do you want us to use what you have given to us? And that the DNA of every Christ follower is this heartbeat for generosity, this heartbeat to say, God, I want to hold on to you tightly, and I want to hold on to the things of this world loosely. I don't want to serve or be a, a slave to the things of this world. I want to be a servant of yours. So God, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. Look at verse 8. He, he says, I'm not commanding you. But I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. I love that. He says, I'm not commanding you. I mean, but giving all is really, it's really a test of your sincerity. It, it really is. I mean, it, it's saying, hey, I want to I follow. I'm committed. I'm in. There's an old saying, and I love this. It says, you can give without loving. And people do it all the time, don't you? You're at the grocery store and they say, hey, do you want to give a dollar to support this hospital? And you're like, I don't know anything about that hospital, but you know, okay, I'll give a dollar. But you, you, you can give without loving and people do that. But you can't love without giving. You can't love without giving. If you're a parent and you have a kid, you know, man, you love them. You would give your life. And when you love Jesus and you love God, there's just something in you that says, I want to give. And if there's something in me that I can give back, if there's something in me that I can invest, I want to do it. One day Jesus was teaching. And, and there was a man who came up to him. And the man was really wealthy. And, and the man said to him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you know the commandments, right? He said, yeah, I know the commandments. I, I know the Old Testament. I, I know it. I've kept all the commandments. And I'm sure Jesus is like, okay, you know. But Jesus looked at him and then he said this. He said, okay, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And the man's face fell. And the Bible says he turned and he walked away. Now what's amazing to me about this story is a couple of things. One, it says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. But what's amazing too is Jesus didn't run after him and go, hey, hey, just kidding. Just kidding, you know, come on back. I'm really just looking for part-time people. I'm just looking for people who in their spare time want to just give a little bit or, you know, come on. Jesus let him go. He let him walk. Now, am I saying that Jesus may come to you and say, 
go sell everything you have and give it to the poor? He might. And I've actually had friends who've done it. And they're serving overseas somewhere. And they're loving life. But I'm not saying that he's gonna come to every one of us. You know what? I think, you know, God blesses us. He wants us to feed our family. He wants us to go on vacation. He wants us to have a roof over our heads. I mean, God wants us to have those things. But God also wants us to understand that everything we have is his and if there's a need, if there's an opportunity, and God prompts our heart, God wants us to be able to say, okay, I want to help. I want to, I want to help. I mean, there's somebody who needs a place to live. Come stay with me for a night or so. I've got three extra bedrooms. I mean, if there's somebody who's broken or hurting and I can help, I want to do that. If I can pay for counseling, if I can help you do something, if I can buy you food, I am just the hands and feet of Christ. I am a conduit for God's love and God's grace. And everything I have and everything I am is for him. Some of you, you are blessed with a gift to be able to make money, and you do it well. But in the process of that, do that well, but also continue to be generous, as all of us should. Continue to say, God, you've given me this gift, but God, I don't want to just build my own kingdom. I want to build yours. I want to be a person of generosity. I want to be a person who gives all. Because what I do here impacts eternity. And then the Apostle Paul, he, he says, hey, be inspired by what God did for you. Look at the cross. Look at what the cross, look at what God did for you, verse 9. And here's the gospel right here. He says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Man, I love that verse. What's he saying? Be inspired by what God did for you. That Jesus was on the throne of heaven, being worshiped all eternal glory. But Jesus knew that because you and I had sinned, there was eternal separation from God, holy God, sinful man. And so though he was rich, he became poor. He came down to the earth, fully God, but fully man. And Jesus lived 33 sinless years and he was crucified on a cross by those he created. He was crucified for you to bring man to God, to be the bridge. Why? So that you and I could be rich so that you and I could have eternal glory, so that you and I weren't separated from God for eternity, but that you and I one day would spend eternity with Christ in heaven. And Paul says, look at this. Be inspired by the one who gave all for you. Wow. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. He paid it all. And when you and I begin to think about that, boy, we ought to well up in rich generosity. We ought to well up in rich praise and worship and adoration. And we ought to say, God, protect my heart so I don't fall in love with the things of this world and miss out on the one who truly loves me, who truly loves me. A friend of mine at church uh, sent me this article. It's from the New York Times by a guy named Sam Polk, and it's called For the Love of Money. And he said this, he said, in my last year on Wall Street, my bonus was $3.6 million. And I was angry because it wasn't big enough. I was 30 years old, had no children to raise, no debts to pay, no philanthropic goal in mind. I wanted more money for exactly the same reason an alcoholic needs another drink. I was addicted. I'd learned the importance of being rich from my dad. I tell you, as a dad, that kind of gripped me. You know, what am I teaching my Kids, I'd learned the importance of being rich for my dad. Imagine what life will be like, he'd say, when I make a million dollars. And while he dreamed, we sometimes live paycheck to paycheck off my mom's nurse practitioner salary. Dad believed money would solve all of his problems. And at 22, so did I. I knew exactly what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I wanted to be rich. I went to Columbia University. And yet when I was in college, I became a daily drinker, a pot smoker, and a regular user of cocaine. 
I finally got to the bottom and I went to a counselor. And the counselor said that my abuse of drugs and alcohol was a symptom of an underlying problem, a spiritual problem. (laughs) But I didn't listen. I got a job at the Bank of America, and at the end of my first year, I was thrilled to receive a $40,000 bonus. Still, I was nagged by envy. I wanted a billion dollars. It's staggering to think that in the course of five years, I'd gone from being thrilled at my first bonus of $40,000 to being disappointed my second year at the hedge fund, I was paid only $1.5 million. But in the end, it was my absurdly wealthy bosses who helped me see the limitations of unlimited wealth. I was in a meeting with one of them and a few other traders, and they were talking about this new hedge fund regulations. Most everyone on Wall Street thought they were a bad idea. But isn't it better for the system as a whole, I said. The room went quiet, and my boss shot me a withering look. I remember him saying, I don't have the brain capacity to think about the system as a whole. All I'm concerned about is how this affects me. I felt as if I'd been punched in the gut. He was afraid of losing money, despite all that he had. From that moment on, I started to see with new eyes. Ever see what a drug addict is like when he's used all his junk? He'll do anything to get it fixed. I'd always looked enviously at people who earned more than I did, and now for the first time, I was embarrassed for them and for me. I made in a single year more than my mom made her entire life. And I knew it wasn't fair, it wasn't right, The world would hardly change if all credit derivatives ceased to exist. Not so nurse practitioners. What had seemed normal now seemed deeply distorted. I had been lying to myself. There were plenty of injustices out there, rampant poverty, swelling prison populations, a sexual assault epidemic, an obesity crisis, and not only was I not helping to fix any of the problems in the world, I was profiting from them. My bosses said they would raise my bonus if I agreed to stay to stay several more years. Instead, I walked away. In the three years since I've left, I've married, (laughs) spoken in jails and juvenile detention centers about getting sober, taught a writing class to girls in the foster system, and started a nonprofit called Grocery Ships to help poor families struggling with obesity and food addiction. I am much happier. (laughs) I feel as if I'm making a real contribution. I was lucky. My experience with drugs and alcohol allowed me to recognize my pursuit of wealth as an addiction. The years of work I did with my counselor helped me heal the parts of myself that felt damaged and inadequate so that I had enough at the core of me to be able to walk away, DNA. I generally think that if one is rich and believes they have enough, quote unquote, they're not a wealth addict. On Wall Street, in my experience, that sense of enough is rare. I recently got an email from a hedge fund trader who said though he was making millions each year, he felt trapped and empty, but he couldn't summon the courage to leave. I believe there's others out there. And maybe together, maybe together we can form a group and maybe together we can make a real contribution to the world. You know, I read that and I was just like, wow. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Now, see, money's not good or bad. I mean, money can be used for good or money can be used for bad. But the fact is money can so easily become the God of our life and resources and stuff and things. And we've got to have more and we've got to have more and we've got to have more. And Christ is going, am I enough? Is your faith and your trust, is it in me? Where is it in the things of this world? Because I'm telling you, if it's in the things of this world, it will never satisfy. No matter if you make $3.6 million in one year or you make a $1.5 million bonus, it's never gonna be enough. The Apostle Paul knew that. The Apostle Paul had been a Pharisee. I mean, he had done well, he had made money. But he writes in Philippians chapter four, verse 11, he says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content Whatever the circumstances, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. And I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through Him, through Christ. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And in our lives, we have to come back and say, am I following Jesus? Jesus. Is he the Lord of my life? 
Am I willing to give all for him? He has blessed me and I'm thankful. (laughs) But I want to hold on to Jesus with everything I have and hold on to the things of this world loosely. And if God, you need them for something, here you go. Paul finishes in 10 through 12. He says, and here's my advice about what is best for you in this matter. Uh, Last year, you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. Get that, according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. You see, giving all is really according to what you have and not according to what you don't. A lot of times we think, well, I don't have that much. I can't do that much. I can't make that big contribution. I can't make that big impact. I can't do this or that. I don't have a massive house. I don't, and he's going, no, 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 no. It's not about what you don't have. It's about what you do. What do you do with what you've been given? How do you steward what's been entrusted to you? Are you giving all? Are you running after God with everything you have? I, I, I love the Old Testament. See, God's brilliant, you know? I mean, we know that he's God, right? You know, but I mean, he started the Old Testament. He was like, I'm gonna make sure that, that people get this. And he, so he instituted what's known as the tithe, where you give your first 10% back to God. And the great part about that is, it doesn't matter whether you're, you're super poor or whether you're super rich. It's just everything, the first 10% I give back to him. I'm trusting him. I'm putting him first. I'm doing this. And then I save the next 10% of whatever he gives me. And then I live on 80%. And what that does is I live below my means. And when I live below my means, then I don't have to be a slave to debt. I don't have to be a slave to the things of this world. I don't have to get consumed with all that. I can put God first. And when you and I put God first and you and I begin to walk around and just say, I'm yours. (laughs) I mean, look at what you've given me. Look at the way you've blessed me. And God, what do you want to do through me? You know what? My life has changed, but also the lives of others. Also the lives of others. You think about how Jesus took 11 men and he changed the world. Why? Because these people were willing to reach out. These people were willing to grow up and mature in their faith. And these these men were willing to give all. And it started a movement that has come to us. And as his disciples today, we have this call. And as you and I you and I begin to be generous and invest in others and give back, lives are changed and transformed. I want you to see this news clip that happened just this past week, and I want you to see the difference that we can make together. Pleasing people. Khadija Muhammad devotes her life to service on and off the job. When she's not working as a server at Cheddar's, she's making homemade pies, soup, muffins, and serving it to the homeless on her own. And I'll stop and say, hey, you want some soup? You want a hot cup of soup? But all that service stopped this month when Khadija's mother in Ohio had a heart attack. And all I wanted was just to see my mother one more time. She saw her mom and helped her pull through. But in the process, Khadijah missed a lot of work and did not have enough money to pay her bills. Your second and final notice of past due bill to prevent service disconnection. Still, she went to work Wednesday and delivered service with a smile. This one table sat down. It was a man, a woman, and they had a small child. The father ordered a country steak. The mother and the son, they split a, a fish taco. They were really humble people. You know, they signed their receipt. It was sitting on the table, but it was turned upside down. And normally as a server, whenever a ticket is turned upside down, that means either you didn't get a good tip. When Khadijah turned over the receipt, it turned her life upside down. And I was like, oh my God, and I just lost my balance. And I was like, does this say a thousand dollars? Actually, it said $1,075, along with a note. It says, Jesus has blessed us, and we were led to give it to you. God bless. I mean, what I'm thinking now is I believe it. I do believe God did send them my way. Khadijah says she has no clue who the generous tippers are, but she knows what she wants to tell them. Thank them. Thank them so much. Because I'm humbled. I'm grateful. You were, I do believe that God led you to me at this time in my life. But I do, I, you know, I hope and pray that someday I'm able to do this for somebody. And at the first opportunity, I would do it. Wow. I, I, I love that. 
Jesus has blessed us. <laughs> Jesus has blessed us and we were led to give this to you. And I love what she said at the end. I, I pray in my life I'll be able to do that for somebody someday. See, that's contagious generosity. That's when you and I just give all and God takes and he multiplies and lives are impacted and lives are changed. And that's what God wants to do through us together. When God calls you, he draws you to himself, he invites you into this relationship with him, you get to see God do what only God can do. And there's nothing like it. This morning we have the incredible privilege to, to celebrate the grace that's happened in our lives. And it's communion. And so I'm going to invite you in just a moment to come to one of the tables. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you've given your life to him, there's three tables that are set up here. There's a gluten-free table over here. There's two tables that are in the back. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he called his disciples together and he said, guys, guys, listen. He took a piece of bread and he said, this is my body and it's broken for you for you, personal. Take and eat and remember it's of me. And after supper, he, he took the cup. And he says, this cup, it's the, it's the new covenant. You were under the old covenant where you sinned and you blew it and you were separated. There's a holy God and you were separated because of your sin. But there's a new covenant now. I'm paying the price. It's called grace, generosity. Take and drink and remember it's of me. For when you eat this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so this morning, I want to invite you. Our worship team is going to play. But I want to invite you to respond, to come to the table, to break off a piece of the bread, to listen as it's broken, to think about Christ's body broken for you, to dip into the cup his blood poured out for you, and to receive the gift that only God can give. I want you to think about all that God's given to you and the way that God has constantly come through for you. And maybe this morning you just put a stake in the ground and say, Jesus, I'm willing to give all. I'm yours. Father, here we are gathered as your disciples today and we come to your table. Father, thank you for Jesus and for hope and for grace. And Father, we give our lives to you right now. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray and we respond in worship. Amen.